Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Greatness Engineering Hour show. This is Mireille, Mireille Tulekima. And uh, as you know me, the Greatness Engineer. And today I'm bringing you another uh, exceptional guest. Uh, we're going to the US. And we're going to talk about uh, a, a very interesting subject. And I think uh, it's it's actually a subject that is that needs some attention. And the topic, as I, I, you know, I put it, is better seeds, better food, better future, and correcting our upside-down food uh, system everywhere. And so, as you can you you can imagine, it's going to be about food, but we're going to focus on a particular uh, project today. So, who is you know who is my my guest? I'm just going to give you. Uh, you know, a brief introduction, and she will have the opportunity to introduce herself, you know, as uh, as we start, you know, our conversation. My guest is Margaret Mazel. She's the founder of Visual Firm, uh, Farm, sorry, and she's a molecular geneticist. So she's going to explain to us what it's all about. And she's right now an advocate for a machine learning system and solution to help farmers regenerate their uh, their landscape. And uh, Margaret will, you know, introduce herself obviously and give us, you know, a little bit more information because I think it's something that is new, something that is innovative, and something that will help us because we uh, we can, you know, hear in the news that uh, there is uh, a potential, uh, you know, food crisis. So it's the right moment to talk about, uh, uh, you know, what she uh, she's doing and the project that she's involved with. So sit, sit, uh, sit tight and have your pen and paper because I know there's going to be a lot, you know, shared today. And make sure you participate. If you have any question to ask uh, Margaret, don't hesitate to, you know, to comment. Don't hesitate to give your insight because this show is for you. This show is for you to learn. And it's also for, you know, the guests to be able to connect with you and see how you can, you know, collaborate and bring things, things to the next level. So we're going to start the conversation. I'm going to bring... Uh, Margaret today, but we're first going to have uh, some music and then start, you know, this amazing conversation with Margaret. Another episode of the Greatness Engineering Hour show, the show that is brought to you by the Birei Telekima Global Leadership Organization. What feel is important is if you just look at the word compassion, when uh -huh. it's behavior, it's something that can be learned and it is something that we can embody through habits and through our daily actions. To get this idea that if we interject this wisdom intentionally, mm -hmm. uh, it is, it, I call them needle movers. It's the needle mover that's missing. Um, don't deprive the world of your greatness. Mm -hmm. Don't do that anymore. You know, dare to excel, dare to be sexy, dare to be you, dare to be the best version of yourself. Uh, impact yourself positively and from, from there, impact others. And you are not alone.
we are we are you know we are here margaret is here welcome margaret to the greatness engineering hour show it is a pleasure i was anticipated this conversation because i know that we're going to learn so much from you and uh, on a subject that is you know of actuality because we talking a lot about food and uh, this crisis that everybody is kind of you know uh, you know uh, uh, you know forecasting but before we get into you know the seriousness of the this this um, this conversation i just want you to introduce yourself let let us know who you are and what are the key things that you know you you want to share with us today all right, thank you very much for having us uh, on your show. And uh, I wanted to say first though, hello to all your followers and to Visual Farms LinkedIn team, uh, some of whom I know are watching this morning. Uh, just a little bit about my story and how I encountered why we need to be looking at regenerative agriculture to save our planet and grow the food we need to grow. I started out my story is about five chapters, but I was born in Victoria, British Columbia. I imprinted in the Pacific Northwest, uh, but I started my professional life as a molecular geneticist in medical research, starting mm -hmm. at uh, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, then going to Harvard Medical School, and then ending up at uh, the National Institutes of Health. I love molecular genetics. I, it was fascinating, a lot to learn. But while we were at NIH, my husband and I bought a farm in the Shenandoah Valley, 55 miles west of Washington, D.C. So I became a farmer, and that's when I changed scales from molecules <laughs> to landscapes. And we raised a cow-calf operation for 15 years. I fell in love Mary, with farmers, with farming, with agriculture, and I could see that there are many things that we could do to help farmers mm -hmm. become more profitable. I also got very interested in policy. So I became a policy maker too. I chaired our planning commission for 10 years and introduced a new zoning program that's still in place in Virginia. And in Virginia, zoning is very difficult to keep for more than one or two years. Our conservation areas are through permanent uh, conservation easements. But then I moved to the state level after introducing zoning in Clark County and many other conservation programs. The goal was to protect farming, water resources, the Shenandoah River and the Blue Ridge Mountains and uh, open space. So I, in the, at the state level, I authored new legislation there to establish a state uh, commission for land records mon modernization and was appointed by the governor to chair it. And so I did that for about five years. Then five years later, I co-founded a program that was national and it was through, mm -hmm. through congressional funding uh, to mm -hmm. help rural communities integrate geospatial information and GISs uh, while it was still rural and still had uh, options. We worked mm -hmm. with federal agencies, primarily NRCS at USDA. It was a great time. We worked with a state, six state conservationists in Chesapeake Bay. We modeled concentrated animal feeding operations, transported nutrients to the bay, and to balance things out, we modeled septic fields for, to surface and groundwater. And with the bay program, we transported those impacts into the Chesapeake Bay. We built a whole new database to look at the state and use and potential of the nation's resources. And then mm -hmm. we were able to see that um, there was a real potential through using chemicals and pesticides to impact ground and surface water. That was a major study. 12 monographs uh, were, uh, 12 part articles were printed in a monograph published by NRCS. So in about, about 1990, I decided to do an M&A with Deer and Company. I'm a Westerner, as you know, so I moved out to Fort Collins. That was the winter of the dot-com crash. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like a lot of people are doing now, I became a consultant. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, I ended up working with uh, Monsanto, uh, fertilizer companies, seed companies, and that's when I could see we had to do something to capacity build, not just American farmers, but farmers everywhere. Our economic uh, structure for agriculture is upside down. 
Our mm-hmm. farmers are not being they're not being con- compensated fairly for the risks that they take. They're the sources for our diversified and healthy food solutions if they move to regenerative agriculture or in that direction. Uh, and consumers don't really know what's in their food or the experience that the crop had on the farm. And that's mm-hmm. why we've moved to using something called machine learning. It's deep reinforcement learning, and it is a daily tracking of climate, farm practices, uh, the condition of the soil, the response of the crops, and the agroecosystem within which that farm is operating. Our approach mm-hmm. is not top down, it's bottom up. Farms first, we start from the farm. And that's what regenerative agriculture is doing. So we started a company, um, three people from Deer. Uh, one mm-hmm. is uh, Jim Hall, he invented what's called the yield monitor, the GPS component of it is the most ubiquitous precision farming tool used around the world. Jim oh, wow. had 11, 11 patents assigned to deer. Uh, also Cecil Samuel, uh, who was working with us on the first um, farm um, business management tool in 2000 when, when the internet was pretty slow and farmers didn't really trust it. But Mm -hmm. we then reconnected and uh, Cecil brought with him a healthcare application, which was real time machine learning. And it was B to C for us, the farm is the patient. And uh, this was a great advantage because we didn't have to build everything. We could Mm -hmm. hop on in a way and specialize it so that it could become from healthcare to uh, regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. Then, are you ready to hear all, all the more I want to do? <laughs> yes, because I mean, it's it's uh, it's important to understand the story because, uh, <laughs> you, you know, it, it's just such a new area for not only for farmers, you know, traditional farmers, but also for the consumer to understand, you know, what's going on and what 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 is really happening in the agriculture industry and how, you yes. know, uh, you know, the uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution is also having an impact in the food chain. Yes. And that's uh, that's an important, you know, important point to make. So, uh, yes, we want to know the story. We want to know the okay. story. And, and especially one thing that I'm curious about, because I, I know that change and innovation is not always easy. So it's just right. to know what are the key challenges that you had to go through and how did you, you know, manage that? How did you handle? Because I, I presume that they probably had, you know, a lot of obstacles and a lot of questions from the farmer <laughs> themselves, because this is something completely different than, you know, that what they are used to. Yes, uh, it is. And they all said that. Um, Mm -hmm. What we did is we formed a company uh, with, uh, right now we have um, Cecil Samuel as our CTO for the platform. Jim Hall is a consultant for AI specific agriculture domain. That's a very rare combination. Uh, But Mm -hmm. Jim and I about seven years ago started looking at the input cost of farmers and we could see that seeds were really important. So over Mm -hmm. seven years to get the statistics good, we built what we believe is the country, the world's largest hybrid seed performance database. And it's built from the commercial companies, pre-commercialization hybrid seed trials, which they use to promote and market their new varieties. And Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we got asked all the time, especially from VCs who made their money writing code, what mm-hmm. took you so long? <laughs> and exactly. I'll, I'll never, <laughs> forget that. Farming mm-hmm. in, in our crops, corn and soybeans that we were doing and um, wheat, it's a year-long enterprise. You can't just write code and change an app you know, overnight. Mm-hmm. This was very hard to understand. The other thing is that agriculture is not a simple industry. It's very highly scientific, requires multidisciplinary teams. And if you don't come from the industry, there's a big learning curve. And we know Mm -hmm. investors invest in what they know. So Mm -hmm. we also found out, interestingly, we started out thinking, gee, in the industry, they know us, they'll understand us, they'll know what we're doing. We went for almost two years promoting visual farms. And what did we get? Crickets. We then decided, (laughs) 
<laughs> and, and we didn't use pesticides. <laughs> mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we, uh, we realized our, our investment was not going to come from inside our own industry. And there are reasons why that I, it's taken me a while to realize that our investment mm -hmm. is going to come from the outside. That meant we had a big education effort to do. And we're really starting on that now. And Mariah, what you're doing now with us is our first public launch of describing what we want to do and know how to do and have tested in field trials. Uh, and I can say that just by planting the right seed, not the seed that's being sold for profitability by a commercial seed company by seed by sales territory, but the seed that's best matched to that farm. By just planting mm -hmm. that seed, not doing anything differently, yields went up by an average of 25%. And wow. profitability, at that point, then could cover up to 70% market prices, depending and costs, uh, up to 70% of all input costs. We mm -hmm. also built mm -hmm. a new tool that we call Farm Forecast. It is going to use on the platform the reinforcement learning, where the technology collects all the information, the practices, the climate, the landscape, the crops, goes back to the landscape, collects information, monitors its status, and pretty soon it learns what that farm is going to do in response to what the farmer does. And in the end, it's a lot better to predict an issue mm -hmm. than it is to experience it. And because our systems were so accurate, trained on our hybrid seed performance data sets, our accuracy was within two and a half percent for yield estimation starting in July. If nothing untoward mm -hmm. happened like a hailstorm or something serious. Now in agriculture, there are, there are just a few days sometimes you have as a window. Pollination is about a three day window. Things can happen in one day that can destroy mm -hmm. your yield or reduce it. Now we know, or should know, uh, using regenerative agriculture, uh, what that will be and how to properly uh, use chemicals if you have to. But in regenerative agriculture, it's a different story. And I can talk about that a little bit later, but that is our product. And mm -hmm. on top of that, uh, the platform is what's called open. Uh, it's an open structure. So that any model, and we are modelers, uh, that, it, uh, that is available and has been tested in the field, and people need to know if you test something in a platform, you have to make it work in the field. The platform mm -hmm. is almost a given, certainly for us, because our platform is already working in healthcare and it's proven to be successful. So mm -hmm. you have to field trial your products. So we tr field trialed both of our new AI products. Our farmers had said, as soon as Visual Farms is on the ground, we're customers. They have mm -hmm. never seen anything like this. And all of them got better yields. All of them made money by planting just the right seed. What we found mm -hmm. out also in addition is those seeds, there are many ecosystems around North America that are the same. The mm -hmm. seeds performed, generally speaking, in every one of those ecosystems the same. Try to get it to grow in another. Some of them just couldn't perform. What's important is those ecosystems are repeated around the world. Mm -hmm. We've talked to seed companies, and they agree they're already looking at this, but for their own mm -hmm. seeds. We're looking at it for the whole seed market, which we have in this database. And we believe we can transfer seed performance by ecosystem around the world. And that's really important because 80% of farmers around the world have said they need climate resilient uh, new hybrid seeds. Mm -hmm. we, we have them in our database. We know where they are. On top of that, non-GMOs are performing pretty much as well as GM GMOs without the mm -hmm. chemicals, without the genetics. And that's really important to transfer globally. That means we could save 13 years of development for new seeds wow. and $150 million per variety. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. uh, given the closing window with climate change, Ryan, it's becoming very important to do this. However, in other countries, we need strategic partners. We have to start from the bottom in North, in. Uh, Africa. There are um, many NGOs who are working directly with farmers. They are natural partners with us. But the other natural partners must be the countries, their agricultural mm -hmm. agencies, and they must also be the global 
organizations who have the money. This is a major proposed change. And we have to have the buy-in of everyone in a strategic partnership like that. So that's what we're going mm -hmm. to do in our first year of development in the United States is build partnerships for around the world, prove the platform in a wider customer base, and then work uh, with all due diligence with wonderful partners we've already found in Africa to transfer mm -hmm. seed performance. Mm -hmm. And and I can imagine. I mean, uh, how do you link with because the the um, the role of the government is must be huge in in you know creating this integration. So how do you relate you know to the government? Because I see in a lot of country a lot of tension right now between government yes. and and farmers. Uh, we've yes. we've seen what's going on in uh, in Holland. And there, yes. there's been a, a lot, you know, a lot of things that that happen also in India. So how do we how do we create this collaboration and, and this, you know, uh, 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 you know, work in teams that you need to integrate something like that? It's a really important question. There are a lot mm -hmm. of new initiatives is going on. The African Development Bank has dedicated $1.2 billion to help farmers. And effectively, the bank is operating like a co-op. When mm -hmm. you go to far, go to market, you must, we must go, even deer must go through farmer-owned co-ops. And that is mm -hmm. the structure that we have to go through in other countries. But with the, with the African Development Bank acting like a co-op, they would be a logical partner. But you know what the logical question is? Is this still a top-down problem that we've had that has created the, the loss of nutrition, the loss of, of, of strength, the loss of life in our soils? And that's operational. It's working. So is it really mm -hmm. a, a bottom-up or is it the same old, same old top-down that's been leading mm -hmm. to degraded soils? Um, our soil, 75% of our soils have been degraded. And as a GIS person, the first thing I do is overlay crops. In those areas where crops are most mm -hmm. degraded, it's where corn and soybeans, where the goal has been to yield for yields. And when you want that, you don't want anything else except your crop. It turns out you don't mm -hmm. even apparently want even the microbiome, which is essential for the health of that crop. So the chemicals mm -hmm. that are used in, in industrial agriculture, it's called extractive agriculture, it's got several names, conventional agriculture, those technologies have an effect, I believe, clearly shown that they are destroying the microbiome of the plants, which is how the plants get nutrients, water, that's how they strengthen, that's how they grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, there are many things that uh, really differentiates conventional or extractive farming from regenerative farming. First of all, mm -hmm. they use uh, synthetic chemicals that are, are the problem for soil loss. Uh, we can't grow food on chemicals and sand. But mm -hmm. I'm sad to say right, that's the direction that things seem to be going. And so there's a huge amount of pressure to change that. So mm -hmm. can we change it? There's a huge amount of pressure from the top down people because it's a few corporations making a lot of money who want to exactly. push that technology. That's mm -hmm. if you're a farmer, as I was, you don't want that. You don't. But I have to say farmers will use what's available. It's not mm -hmm. a farmer's problem. It's just that those tools were available for the last 20 years. And now mm -hmm. we've got the job of recovering what's been lost if we're going to have the food that we need by 2050. Now, mm -hmm. uh, organic farmers, regenerative farmers, their goal, they want yields, but their goal is to preserve the life of the soil, the viability mm -hmm. of the soil, to engender it, to grow it, so that in the long term, while degradation is happening to soil quality through conventional agriculture, soil life is increasing. And we have mm -hmm. to get the banks to understand this. Regenerative farming is a much better investment in the long term because of what's going, what's happening now and what could happen in real time. Uh, machine learning monitored regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's let's have a break. We'll, we'll come back. I have a few questions that I want you to ask, but I'll, I'll we'll, we'll take a break and we'll be back to, you know, to to talk about this really interesting and intriguing, you know, uh, subject. 
And I hope that the audience uh, is enjoying it, whoever is watching or whoever is going to watch, you know. So don't hesitate to ask any question because I know yeah. that um, it is it is new and uh, and there's probably a lot of, you know, question that you want to ask. So don't hesitate. So we will be back in a few minutes. Don't don't go anywhere. Thank you. Mary. back we are back with margaret and as you could see from the commercial we've been around for quite some time it's been three years and i i'm not counting the episodes anymore i think it's episode 226 <laughs> so, uh, so it's uh, it's just you know amazing an amazing journey and uh, today i have margaret margaret mazel and you know if you've been with us from the beginning you could hear, you know, uh, you know how do, what she was talking about and what they're doing with machine learning to help the farmers. And and I think one question that I have, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, climate change, and uh, just wanted to understand how do you think what you're doing is contributing to that, and uh, and what are you know what are the incentives based on your work. Uh, to get the right policies, you know, in place, because we we still we know that it's still all over the place right now. Right, you're exact. You're exactly right. Um, of course, regenerative agriculture is all about regenerating soil health, and part mm -hmm. of that is restoring carbon to the soil. There mm -hmm. are also practices that you can put by planting the right plants with very deep root structures, such as hemp. Uh, that mm -hmm. will draw carbon from the atmosphere and put it back in actively into the soil. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting area in which to go. Uh, and um, uh, I think that um, uh, we're going to need many things, um, but it, it's never too, um, too soon to start. Uh, regenerative agriculture is um, uh, focused uh, unlike conventional agriculture, on maintaining the microbiome of the soil. Mm -hmm. And those are all the organisms that feed the plants above. If you don't have a solid microbiome, you're not going to have robust plants. And sometimes you want to get rid of it if you're a conventional farmer because it gets in the way. That's, that means there's a dead area at the very end where they cannot go any farther into carbon sequestration because protecting the microbiome will add carbon back into the mm -hmm. soil. So there are shared practices between conventional agriculture and regenerative. And those are things like cover crops and those practices that protect soils from erosion. And that's been a, a, a real set of practices NRCS has, 
at USDA in the United States has learned a lot about, and there's a way to quantify carbon, knowing what the practices have been historically on the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, but that soil erosion, and that is now more recently, more excitingly, carbon sequestration. But in regenerative mm -hmm. agriculture, you can get both of those plus more carbon sequestration by protecting the microbiome and in strengthening uh, soil health and also so the nutritional value of the crop. It's been shown now that under regenerative agriculture, the nutritional value of crops is higher than under conventional agriculture. Mm -hmm. This is important to consumers. Using blockchain, you can apply traceability. So mm -hmm. on the farm, you record the experience of the crop, the customer knows where the, where the food came from and what has happened to it along the food supply chain. This is important. We must enlist farmers and consumers as those most interested parties who are least served, I have to say, by current food supply chains. Now, uh, uh, there's a, a, a lot of controversy about this because we're going to need standards. And what I would say is that a lot of people are trying to take standards from regenerative agriculture in this part of the country and compare them to this part of the country. They're not going mm -hmm. to be the same. They're going to be by agroecosystem. You like agroecosystems. So one of the things you can do with a platform that's scalable is trade and share solutions and get education going much more quickly. Research can go much more quickly. Researchers then are all working on the same place with the same inputs in the same climate. It's an extremely powerful way to fast track mm -hmm. adoption of regenerative agriculture. I don't know mm -hmm. if I answered all your questions, Mariah. You asked some really good ones. So I, yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, that that's uh, that's a good an answer because I think what I've seen because I'm actually from you know the energy yeah. sector where we are you know com we we are you know people are just making you know the the climate change problem about us but yet yeah. you know there are different you know different area where you know we can get some solution and and area that people don't see you know problem that people don't see like the one that you just described where it is important to track the crop it is important that we yeah. have the right soil and we plant the right seeds so that it doesn't uh, you know uh, degenerate the, the soil so all of this it's important and to to just you know have the message across that you know Climate change is not just something that the energy sector has to solve. It's it's across the you know across industry and understand where we can you know we can win, have some some wins and 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 think that you know we have under our control because when we talk about agriculture or we talk about food, it's about us you know it's about us we eating this food so it's we have we have you know power to make an impact and and solve this you know this big problem so that's uh, that's that's definitely uh uh something that i've learned today and and uh, and it's yes. actually forcing my my you know my uh idea that we need to solve it at every level it's not just one or two industries going to be everybody involved so i mean exactly. just to um just to ask you because you know you've been doing all this work and uh, so what is the next step in terms of you know um because i assume that uh, this is new information how do you educate people because you we basically have to go from you know the you know at school starting at school up to you know uh to to the corporations and and uh, the farmers and even the communities so how how are you you know working all of this it's a um i have to say as a researcher if you by the time you work for you you write a you do the experiments you write the paper you get it reviewed two years can go by Things are mm -hmm. changing so fast right now that actually the best source of information about regenerative agriculture is on LinkedIn. It's mm -hmm. right here. It's happening right here. Mm -hmm. Farmers, mm -hmm. though, are show me people. They are very, American farmers are very cynical. African farmers have not had good experiences. Um, mm -hmm. The seed companies have transferred their North American model over to Africa. That's mm -hmm. why it's not working. African farmers are not getting the seed that they need 
and it can't be GMOs in certain countries, although some efforts have been afoot to try and get those seeds into countries that really want to maintain the EU as a market. Mm -hmm. They can't have GMOs in their products. And Mm -hmm. there are some very good non-GMOs, mostly in wheat, where there's protein and higher nutrition. Um, It's uh, uh, where we are right now is um, we have field trialed our components. They're ready to go on a platform. We're raising, of course, we're always raising. Mm -hmm. I I need to tell you though, a really great development. We are finalists in the Women Founders Network Fast Pitch Contest, and we'll be pitching (laughs) we'll be pitching Mm -hmm. on October twenty fifth at UCLA. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking forward to this very much. Am I? What you're doing right now is our launch. It's our christening into public information, and I can tell. I might become um, a real advocate, and I want to, for regenerative farming and saving our world (laughs) with carbon sequestration Mm -hmm. and healthier soils. Um, Mm -hmm. An interesting thing has happened in terms of results. A company called White Leaf Provisions just announced on LinkedIn, I think yesterday, that Sprouts is going to acquire six of their products because they are a certified regenerative uh, company that provides baby food, and they Mm -hmm. have also... um, proven that there is no glyophosphate in that baby food. And what makes that so important is that the CDC just did a study that showed of 650 infants, 87% mm-hmm. percent had glyphosate in their urine. Wow. Wow. That's uh, not good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, But kudos to White Leaf Provisions. I'm thrilled for them, but they have established two criteria. There are no chemicals, or at least not glyphosate, uh, in their product, and they are certified regenerative agriculture. They've used a European company for standards because we don't have any here. And as they say, that's been their North Star. We must Mm -hmm. get standards here, and we're going to have to look at the Netherlands. We're going to have to look at Europe. So they have standards. They are moving ahead, but we're Mm -hmm. behind. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm very keen on, and so is everybody, I think, finding indices and metrics for microbiome health. That's going to be crop specific, it's going to be agroecosystem specific, and in our system describing farms, there are 700 different crops that are, that are tracked by USDA every year for commodity program payments for production. Uh, and we have a system that looks at farms. We know every farm in the country, every farm field, their history, their crops, their acres, their risks, and their successes. Mm-hmm. We know our American farms. Um, mm-hmm. There are other ways to know African farms. But there are people in Africa who are amazing. Um, and I think first of Francis uh, Bosa. He is a soil expert. He is a very loud voice. He's a wonderful man. He's principled. I've enjoyed talking to him. And we're looking he's for here. partners like that. Mm-hmm. He's in Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's in Nigeria. Yeah, he's here watching, actually. So it's an amazing and <laughs> inform- informative <laughs> session, the way to go. So, hey, Francis is, is here watching. So I might have to invite him as well to get more information oh, yes. specifically to you know, for, for Africa. So thanks for joining Francis. Yes. So yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I like what you're saying because sometimes when we look at agriculture, we think that any, you know, any tools or, you know, processes that, that are used in the developing, in the developed countries can actually work in the developing countries. So some of the farmers are trying to copy what's happening there without looking at you know the the context in their country and like you say looking at the soil and looking at the product that are coming and see uh, can they actually adapt to that and uh, and on top of that there are also you know no standard to really you know look look yeah. up for and and that's uh, that's an issue that needs to be you know that that needs to be resolved and we need, I hope there are African listening here. We need some, you know, people to stand up because food is an important part of yeah. everything. Uh, and uh, if we if we, we, we don't pay attention, it's going to be, you know, critical and we're going to go into a crisis in, yeah. you know, in a few years. So it's, it's a really important 
part of the the thing. So let's have another another break, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll finish the because wow, it's already you know forty minutes, so it's went really <laughs> fast. But uh, let's have a break, and we will be back uh, for the last part of the show. And for those who are listening, I think there there are a few people here. There's hello, uh, Supriya is watching from India. We have Francis from Nigeria and we have uh, Tulile. She's watching from South Africa. So, you know, a couple of uh, people from all over the world that are listening to, uh, to our conversation right now. So don't go anywhere. Uh, I hope you've taken notes, whoever, you know, uh, is watching. And uh, if you have any question, please don't hesitate to, you know, to refer the question to me and I will ask the question to right. Margaret. So don't go anywhere. We will be back in, I think, two minutes. Thank you. So we are back. We are back with uh, Margaret and we are talking about food, regenerative uh, agriculture, if you never heard about that. And uh, it has been, you know, uh, an amazing exchange. And uh, I'm learning myself today, uh, key learning that I have. So I'm, I also have my notes. So I hope you're taking notes. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, Margaret, you know, because, you know, what you know, because obviously you, you're already making an impact, you know, in, in the U.S. and, you know, uh, whatever work that you're doing is appreciated. So what do you think is going to bring what you're doing, you know, to the next level? What is needed and what is, you know, um, the agenda in a way of, uh, of virtual farm uh, as, we, as we stand? Uh, thank you for that question, Ryan. We, um, since we're raising, we have already raised half a million dollars where we did a lot of work uh, on the platform. Uh, we put our seed system on the platform with a user interface. Uh, and so we're looking for funding, which is on the order of pre-series A, around 5 million, which could complete the whole project. Within the mm -hmm. first year, we would launch eight products. Within the second year, eight products. Uh, corn, wheat, and soybeans for best seed choice, and the same for farm forecast. We would like to bring on some hemp farmers. We think that is really important. Uh, and um, so by the end of two years, the metrics look really very good for a 4.5% market penetration. Remember, we know our farms. We know where they all are. We know how to get to them. And then in the United States, there's only 112,000 of the largest farmers, but they're operating mm -hmm. more than half of the 300 million acres in cropland, primarily as corn, wheat, and soybeans. So... Mm -hmm. Our job is to get best seed choice first on the ground, get revenue because everything an investor wants to know is where's your traction. We understand that. Uh, and uh, while we're doing that first year, that's when we want to, with an expanded set of customers, start planning strategic partnerships, partnerships in other countries. Uh, and we mm -hmm. know that takes time. And it, we know it builds strategic, it needs strategic partnerships. The country has to want to do it. The global organizations have to want to do it. Um, things are happening now, and the question still is, is this a top-down program or a bottom-up? Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, World Bank and uh, FAO have both recognized that we've been on the wrong track in not supporting directors directly farmers and consumers, that just mm -hmm. supporting the middlemen has been destructive in many ways. And that's where the cost increases are occurring in food. It's not going to the farmer. It's going mm -hmm. to the processor. 
Uh, and they're putting in additives and things that we don't know about. They're hidden in that bottom 20% where there are too many components to list on a label. Mm -hmm. uh, this has to change. People have to know what's in their food. Uh, and um, so our, um, our strategy is to, uh, with just $5 million, you remember we're hopping on top of a healthcare platform in which billions have been spent over the last 20 years, where food and agriculture have only spelt, spent millions on applications like this. So wow. we saw in the 80s this was coming, but we've been waiting for the technology to be right, and finally it's right, but it's complex, Mariah. Mm -hmm. Investors, I, I, you know, they can't be blamed. If they wrote code that changed something in a day, that's why they ask what took you so long. Agriculture mm -hmm. is complex. Investors only invest in what they know, uh, and that's why we have a major education uh, uh, effort to undergo. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that changing, but the question will always be, is this solution the old time top down or is it really mm -hmm. farm first and farmers? And we must do that if we don't preserve, again, I've said several times, the life of the soil, we'll have nothing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I told you so after the fact doesn't do very much when everybody's hungry. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, uh, when, if you're going to effectuate change, there will be a certain amount of increased risk. If there isn't any risk, you still got the status quo. And that's one of the problems with investments. Bankers are conservative. Right now, people are especially conservative. Uh, but we have got to make some major new steps to change things, to turn our upside down economy right side up to demonstrate the value of regenerative agriculture. There's work for everyone. No one should be protective of what they're doing. In good mm -hmm. platforms, you can share results. We have to share. We're still mm -hmm. making money, but we have to move forward. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's our strategy. Uh, we know that some of the larger banks uh, really do look at a project that's already got revenue and they won't necessarily look at something under 70 million. We have a strategy there where we want to get that 5 million going, prove the platform in North America, and that we have partners in other countries, and then mm -hmm. go to major banks where the, the funding could be 10 million per country. And then you're mm -hmm. looking at 100 million or more investment. This is not a small effort, but we're mm -hmm. beginning on the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, 100 million is, is you know, uh, uh, I mean, talking about what I see in the energy sector, 100 million is sometimes just the price of drilling a well. So <laughs> why can't we put 100 million to, you know, for for something that is even more, more important? So that's uh, that's just, you know, I think sometimes it's 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 good to put things in perspective because 100 million is is easily gone in in you know in in the industry in the energy sector so i have a lot of comment here there is tulile tulile is based in south africa and she proposed a collaborative project uh, so i'll make sure to connect you to tulile and uh, and maybe you can you know talk to her uh, she she might have something interesting for you in uh, in South Africa. Mark is here. Mark, thank you. Mark is uh, so there's a long long one. Uh, so uh, we talk a lot about existential crisis this day without question though. So agriculture is at the end of the solution to the sustainability issue. That's what I understood today, contributing from the environmental, economic and social side. So if we improve agriculture and food system, we can improve the livelihood and the health, you know, because that's the thing, the health of people and produce healthier yeah. ecosystem as well. So a, according to the estimate, Piled by the Food and Agriculture Organization, by 2050, we will need to produce 60% more food to feed, right. you know, everybody. So that's uh, that's quite a gleam, you know. <laughs> it's not it's not <laughs> far. So thanks, you know, thanks, Mark, for 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 this. And Tulile is here again. Uh, you know, packaging and product needs a lot of experience and more people to, to look at. And that's what you know. That's what Margaret was saying is that you know, there's the middleman. Uh, we don't know what's going on. They they are basically the king, you know, and queen of all of this, and they are, they they have all the additive, and we know what's you know what's the the result at the end of the chain. So 
I'll make sure to connect you uh, to Lily. That's not a problem. And Francis, Francis is supporting. So uh, many thanks, Margaret, uh, in it together. So you are a champion. <laughs> so it has been, you know, uh, uh, amazing. So we're getting to the end of, you know, the, the end of the show. And uh, what I really, really like uh, to know uh, if you have, you know, a particular message to, to the audience today, something that is, you know, really dear to you that you want to leave the audience with. You know, that uh, phrase of Francis's, we're in it together, is very touching mm -hmm. to me. Um, mm -hmm. Being a woman, of course, I parallel process on multi multiple projects at once, but my heart is in what I'm doing, and I know it is with Francis, and I know it is with the regenerative agriculture community. We are in this together. Let's get moving. We don't have time. We're running out of time. We mm -hmm. might have to do something in a we, we might have to share data and information that otherwise in a totally private sector would be called IP. Uh, mm -hmm. We can retain IP. We can retain the value of our products uh, with creative thinking and impact investing is what we're doing. It's longer term, but the returns overall are much larger. Uh, and so I would say, let's think about in, in it together. Uh, I adore what Francis is doing and Kiss mm -hmm. the Ground, the Savory Institute uh, also. Uh, and uh, there are many organizations now working hard to find ways to make a transition into regenerative agriculture, less of a shock and a change. Uh, but we have to do it. That's the thought. We have to do mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have to do it. We are in it together, even if sometimes we don't realize it, because it's uh, it, it's everything is connected. You know, we're talking about agriculture. <laughs> we're talking about what we eat, so which has an impact on our body, on our health, and you know, energy that we need to go and work, even you know, in in, a, in when we work in another industry. So it's important to understand, you know, uh, the the chain, the supply chain, and uh, the origin, what it, where it's coming from, the data, and to be able to adjust and to create sustainability because that's what we we're looking for. So thank you so. Much thank you very, very much to really this. connect with margaret to, yes. to connect with margaret to know more and to get you know more information that that are going to help you know you to understand and get involved because like she said we are in it together and uh, this you know whatever she's she was talking about today the regenerative agriculture is you know is connecting you to her so so make sure you connect with her she's on linkedin and uh, and i think you can also have a look at uh, a company a visual farm to understand exactly what they do and uh, and be ready for for the conversation so thank you so much margaret it has been a pleasure to interact with you. We've had, you know, several conversations and, and I've been really enjoying, you know, talking to you. I've learned so much in the last few weeks. And uh, I thank Mark. Mark is here for the connection. And, uh, and now I know that, you know, there's something that I have to pay attention to as well. You know, look at the agriculture and look at, you know, our regener yes. regenerative agriculture is having, you know, an impact and is helping the climate is helping my myself with my health and every, everyone on the planet. So thank you so much. And uh, I, I would like to thank all the, you know, all the participants today uh, for, you know, for your insight and for uh, your contribution. As you know, this show is for you. This show is to bring you the yeah. knowledge that, you know, we don't have. And again, today was a particular one because I, I know that nobody had you know, this knowledge and, and um, I'm really happy to bring this to, uh, to my global audience. And again, I encourage you to connect with uh, Margaret to know more uh, because there's, there's a lot that she can share. So thank you so much. I will, I will be on break uh, for the show. We will be back. Uh, at uh, we, we will be back in September uh, and uh, and with uh, some you know uh, amazing guests as usual 
and people who are going to share, you know, new knowledge and share their story to help you to become, you know, the best version of yourself. Because as you know, uh, we, the more knowledge you get, the more you grow. And that's really what we want from you. We want you to grow. We want you to get, you know, the best information, the best knowledge so that you can become the best version of yourself. And that's what greatness engineering is all about. So thank you so much. Have a great day, uh, uh, Margaret. And uh, it has been a pleasure to have you on the Greatness Engineering Hour show. And for the audience, see you in September. So thank you very much you. and take care. Okay, everyone else, thank you. Thank you.